said before, I'd like to welcome Dr. Frankovich, Jennifer Frankovich from Stanford University. And I'm thinking, yes. Do you have any jet lag or something? Did you just arrive? Oh, no. No, no, okay. <laughs> Uh, you're probably well known to most of the, per, the people here, but I still have to say that, that you are uh, a rheumatologist, aren't you? And, uh, well, you know, all the titles, it's, it will take till tomorrow if I, if I say all your titles. But anyway, you're um, director of PANS program at Stanford Children Health. Yes. And I've been told uh, from you, actually, that you are going to discuss some examples and well-accepted systemic inflammatory diseases that are associated with uh, psychiatric symptoms. And you will also present some data regarding the signs of systematic inflammation among uh, patients in, in the Stanford PANDAS cohort, aren't you? The stage is yours. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to Gamila and all the organizers of this conference. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm here today because about a decade ago, I noticed that many of my patients in rheumatology clinic, kids with arthritis and other systemic inflammatory diseases, also had psychiatric symptoms. And that when I would treat the underlying inflammatory disease, oftentimes their psychiatric symptoms would start improving. And this is what inspired us to start a neuropsych immunology clinic back in 2012. One great example um, of the link between, between systemic inflammation and psychiatric symptoms is lupus. Um, where OCD is 10 to 15 times more common in lupus than community uh, cohorts. And 25% of children with lupus develop like, some type of neuropsychiatric symptom, most commonly headaches, psychosis, and cognitive dysfunction. And interestingly, the neuropsychiatric symptoms of lupus can be a presenting feature with few other clinical signs. And, like in PANS, PANDAS, the MRI and CSF is typically uh, normal or there's not specific findings. So basically, we don't have markers um, for why these kids um, develop neuropsychiatric lupus. Lupus is also characterized by um, a lot of organ system involvement, but most commonly arthritis, small vessel vasculitis. Um, these kids have high immune complexes and they have activation of complement, which is an arm of the immune system, and it presents as having low C3 and low C4. And the reason I bring this up here in the PANDAS conference is because as a lupus researcher and a rheumatologist, I started looking for these things in our lupus patients, and I'm gonna present that, that data uh, later. One of the other um, rheumatologic disorders that's been linked to psychiatric symptoms is spondyloarthritis, or inflammatory back pain um, syndrome. So inflammatory back pain uh, typically starts um, in young adults, but we definitely see it presenting in children. Um, it um, presents as um, insidious onset pain and stiffness in the morning and with stationary positions, so these kids maybe are always kind of moving a little bit because if they sit still, their back becomes stiff. Um, it improves with movement and exercise and NSAIDs. Um, it can also affect the hips, shoulders, knees, and ankles. And the reason I bring this disorder up is because um, patients with inflammatory back pain have a high rate of OCD, anger, hostility, and 40% have depression and anxiety and they're twice as likely to deliberately harm themselves. And, and again, why am I bringing this up in a PANS PANDAS conference? It's because we saw a lot of our patients and also the uh, first degree family members in our kids um, have inflammatory back pain symptoms. So in 2012, um, I got together with a neurologist as well as Kiki Chang and Dr. Tiedemann, two psychiatrists, um, to put together a clinic 
where we would see kids with a wide range of um, what we thought were neuropsychiatric conditions, primarily psychiatric conditions, driven by immunologic diseases. And there's a whole spectrum of things out there that are associated with psychiatric symptoms. And we wanted to work as a team um, to study these kids and, and more importantly, to help them. But when we started the clinic, the vast majority of patients coming to our clinic were parents and families wanting to work on for pants and pandas. And so ultimately, the neuropsych immunology clinic never kind of took off, and it became the pans and pandas clinic. Um, we started off with a half a day a month, and now we operate five days a week with five full-time clinicians. So Kiki already talked about the basal ganglia and how injury and inflammation in the basal ganglia um, can cause release of inhibitory circuits. So the basal ganglia, as he mentioned, um, controls or fine-tunes movements, mood, emotion, behavior, procedural le learning, cognition. So when you disrupt this, um, you have much difficulty in controlling the, these, um, uh, these functions. And I'm also glad Dr. Chang brought up some Pam's Korea because we really think this is the model and, um, and we also uh, actually think Pam's and Pam's is, is directly on the spectrum of Sydenham's Korea. So Sydenham's Korea is a manifestation of acute rheumatic fever. Um, Dr. Chang was talking about this um, possibility of Pam's and Pam's being an epidemic. Well, we definitely know that acute rheumatic fever is an epidemic, um, especially in developing countries where people live very close to each other. Um, or in close living conditions. Uh, there are about 500,000 new cases of acute rheumatic fever per year, and um, currently uh, there are about 33 million people living with acute rheumatic fever. So this is a very common worldwide. It is the most, um, Sydenham's Korea is the most common acquired Korea in childhood. And as Kiki mentioned, um, it has three components, the emotional liability, um, the hypotonia, so truncal hypotonia typically, um, and the creiform movements that it can affect the limbs and also the face. Um, and it looks like continuous restlessness. So here are some um, of the most common uh, psychiatric symptoms. So these uh, kids that were previously um, normal kids suddenly become ir irritable, emotionally labile, so easy crying or inappropriate laughing. They have outbursts of inappropriate behavior, irrational fears, delusions, um, OCD, distractibility, anxiety. These kids are often described as being overly sensitive or mercurial and abusive. Um, the parents describe these children as, ha as having a sudden personality change. And oftentimes, this is associated with new onset night terrors. And this has been described, as Dr. Chang mentioned, for many decades or even centuries. So this was a publication in 1926 from JAMA um, describing um, Sydenham's Korea and that the emotional liability is being the most constant observation in the study. Uh, children who were previous to the onset of Korea, who are quiet and manageable, suddenly became restless, irritable, extremely sensitive, and abusive. Some children became violent. For instance, patient 11 attempted to kill his younger brother. Another boy attempted to strike his brother with a shovel. Sounds a lot like pants and pandas, huh? Um, the OCD symptoms can start two to four weeks before Korea. This is what led Dr. Sweeto uh, to come up with uh, the sort of the research entity PANDAS as maybe a form frust of Sydney's Korea. Korea can be subtle or masked, so clinicians must actively look for Korea. Um, limb movements should be actually, Dr. Chang, do you want to hop up on the stage? <laughs> Since there's so many clinicians in the room, I thought I would actually show you how to look for Korea. So put your feet together. So this is called the standing romper. Him. <laughs> so in kids with Korea, they tend to have little, yeah, you can show them, little movements. Yeah, good, keep, keep good. Um, and then they can have a hard time, even if they're not moving their hands in the Korea form movement, they can have a hard time kind of keeping their body still. That's very good, Kiki. The other thing they have, <laughs> so pandas 
kids have a lot of finger playing movements, but the Korea form, the, the Korea is more like this. Um, the other thing they have is milk maker. Can, can, can you grab my hands up over here? Thank you. <laughs> so to look for milk maker, if you want to ask the patient to squeeze your hands, okay, squeeze my hands, please, squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. No, yeah. So he's 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 doing this. He's squeezing like this. So so in Sydney's career, you have failure to maintain contraction, and so you grip and then you release, grip, release, and then can you show them what a darting tongue is? <laughs> so a darting tongue is the same thing. Is you can't keep your tongue. The child cannot keep their tongue out. All kids can stick out their tongue. Right. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Can I or maybe they're better at keeping their tongue out, um, but but it's quivering. Okay. Those are called tongue fasciculations or wormy and tongue movements. So these are all signs that you see in Sydenham's Korea. Uh, but interestingly, there's no clear definition of Sydenham's Korea. So if you just have fasciculations in your tongue, or you just have a milkmaid grip, do we call that Sydenham's Korea, or do we call that pandas, if they have really prominent psychiatric symptoms? So some of this stuff, we don't really have a clear border. Great. Oh, let me just show them this. So the other thing they can have is overflow dystonia. So do you want to walk on the sides of your feet? So if you do a stressed gait, so he's going to walk on the outsides of your feet, and yeah, <laughs> they can have posturing movements of their arms. That's great, Kiki. You've been practicing. <laughs> yes, and sometimes they kind of like do it in the front. Yes, this is very good. And the other thing is, is when they do the touchdown sign, then they can have kind of dystonia of one of the hands. The other things with Sydenham's Korea, and we've actually seen this a lot in pants and pandas, is when you ask them to do the standing romper or the, the hands overhead, they have a hard time keeping their arms up. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this here. So they have a lot of arm weakness. Oh, good. Great. Thanks. <laughs> That's exactly right. Good job. <laughs> so, trunkal hypotonia, difficulty standing up, difficulty holding hands, arms overhead. They can also have hyperactive reflexes or hung up reflexes. So the onset of the Korea can be one to eight months after the strep infection. And at this time, the ASO, the strep antibodies, ASO and DNAs B, can be normal. Um, so you can miss the diagnosis of Sydenham's Korea if you're basing it on strep. So actually, it's not a part of the criteria to demonstrate strep. Other manifestations of acute med fever are supportive, but not necessary for the diagnosis. So this is the carditis and valvulitis, which you can look for with an echo. The migratory polyarthritis, so pain in the ankle, and the next day in the knee, and the next day in the elbow. So you have to really ask about these symptoms. Subcutaneous nodules are rare, and erythema marginatum is rare, but we definitely see it. And again, this is something you have to look for. So mild cases of Sydenham's Korea can be mistakenly ascribed to behavior disorders, emotional disorders, restlessness, and clumsiness. And the importance of reporting a patient with acute manic fever is very important because if you have one case, that means that there's a rheumatogenic strain in your community. And we've seen up to three kids in a single classroom um, presenting with acute rheumatic fever, Sydenham's Korea, and pandas. Um, Detection, detection of a case of acute rheumatic fever in a community should lead to, uh, clinicians to start screening more rigorously in their patients. Right now, a lot of the pediatricians in the United States do not do a throat swab when kids come in with a sore throat. That wasn't the case in the 50s and 60s. Everybody got a throat swab. Um, so if you have a case in your community, therefore every kid coming to your clinic now needs to have throat swabs. This is um, erythema marginatum. So if you just ask the family whether the, this rash is present, they won't know. You actually have to heat the core. So having the kid go in a hot bath, or if the kid is in the hospital, really piling on the warm blankets and coming back later and looking to see if this is present. You can see, uh, I guess you can't see it very well, but there's serpiginous borders, so snake-like borders, and this rash moves around. So you look at it, take a picture, walk away, come back, it looks different. So that's, there's only one thing that gives you that kind of rash, and that's, that's uh, acute rheumatic fever. Um, so 
Kiki showed you actually the data from this slide where in pandas you have um, enlarged basal ganglia structures, so the caudate, the putamen, the globus pallidus, but not the thalamus in this study. The same researcher looked at Sydenham's chorea and the data distribution was pretty much the same. So enlargement of these striatal structures. So when Kiki calls it striatal encephalitis, he's actually, that's probably most likely what causes that swelling. And then Dr. Chang mentioned that over time, um, you, tissues can be atretic, and this is true for every inflammatory disease. First it's enlarged, the organ or whatever is inflamed is enlarged, and then it shrinks over time. skipping some of this because Dr. Chang presented it. Um, so why don't I go on to our PANS cohort. Um, so this is the distribution. So these are not kids with Sydenham's chorea and other neuropsychiatric diseases. Um, these are all the kids that meet the strict PANS uh, criteria. So as you can see, the minority of patients have just a single episode. Many go on to having a relapsing and remitting and that's not surprising considering that we think infections trigger this. Um, and 22% of the kids develop a chronic static course. So you can get to that chronic static course through two routes, either primary progressive, so either at the first episode it just becomes chronic, or we have a number of kids that after many relapses, like four to five relapses, they then develop a chronic static course. So this is a, the same sort of distribution that you see with other diseases like multiple sclerosis, um, where you can have a relapsing and remitting course go on to a chronic static course. We suspect the primary progressive cases may be actually different than the relapsing and remitting cases. Uh, so Kiki mentioned all the criteria that you can get um, to get the diagnosis of PANS. And really, it's only two criteria in addition to either the OCD or the eating restriction. Um, but in most of the studies published, and certainly in our cohort, the majority of patients have at least five coexisting um, psychiatric problems or neuropsychiatric problems. Um, urinary changes and uh, sleep issues are very common, especially right at onset. The sleep issues range from insomnia to nightmares, restless sleep, reverse cycling. Uh, but then there's also this uh, finding that is unique uh, in children. It's called REM motor disinhibition. So during uh, REM sleep, so this is supposed to be dream sleep, just, you know, people are supposed to be paralyzed. You're not moving through your dream. Uh, but these kids move during dreams. Um, and this is, in adults, this is a predictor of Parkinson's disease um, in multiple systems atrophy. We don't know that kids are gonna go on to develop this. We suspect that if we treat this disorder um, that they're not gonna have this course. We also see um, hallucinations um, in our patients, but they tend to be transient. Um, they tend to be non-threatening. 6% uh, also have delusions or um, disorganized thinking. Um, but we have seen that those with the psychotic symptoms tend to have higher disease impairment and, higher, and also have a higher caregiver burden inventory. So the parents, so these, these kids are a lot tougher. Um, we also see a, a high rate of concurrent arthritis in our patients with PANS. So when I started the clinic, we were so overwhelmed with all of the psychiatric symptoms, I wasn't doing a good room exam, rheumatology exam. But once we got more staff, I was able to focus on the rheumatology exam, and I was um, surprised at how many of these kids that I don't think studied the rheumatology textbook, but were saying ow in places where ligaments and tendons insert on the bone, and that's called emphysitis-related arthritis. Some of those kids um, have gone on to develop psoriatic arthritis, um, and I'm going to talk about a gene finding later um, with, that is linked to psoriatic arthritis. And we're starting to do ultrasounds of the joints in these kids with PANS. And there's a particular joint finding uh, that we're seeing, we haven't reported on yet, where the capsule is thickened. And this is something that hasn't been reported in children, but it has been reported in adults with psoriatic arthritis. So we suspect that, that maybe ultrasounds is going to help us understand better why these kids are in pain. Um, 
many of our kids go on, or you know, 16% go on, have gone on to develop another autoimmune disease, um, including thyroiditis, celiac disease, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, and type 1 diabetes. This is the time-dependent risk of developing an autoimmune disease after PAMS onset. So it's possible that the infection that triggers PAMS is skewing the immune system and predisposing the development of these other autoimmune diseases. And that's not surprising given the epidemiologic findings um, that there is clustering of autoimmune diseases among um, patients with uh, OCD, Tourette's, and other chronic tick disorders. So because of this link to autoimmunity, we looked at the HLA, um, and we did see um, an overrepresentation of um, several alleles. When we looked at this more carefully using next generation sequencing, sequencing of the HLA region, um, and we can expanded our um, cohort to 113 Caucasian patients with PAMS compared to um, a, a control cohort of 1,000 kids, we found that B38, B52, and B27, um, O2, are highly um, associated with PANS, um, and with the B27 overall um, being associated too. So it's not surprising, um, because B27 is associated with inflammatory back pain and, and that emphysitis-related arthritis I was mentioning. Um, and then the B52 is associated with Bichette's disease, and many of our patients have some uh, signs of small vessel vasculitis, and, um, and I'll show you that data. So what is common between these three alleles I just showed you is that they all contain the HLA BW4 motif, um, and this um, HLA BW4 motif has been linked to other inflammatory diseases as well. Um, it's defined by positions 80 to 83 in the HLA-B um, locus, um, and dimorphism at position 80 refines uh, the binding affinity for KIR 3 dl So KIR is a receptor on NK cells, a killer inhibitory receptor, and it co-evolved with BW4. Um, so enrichment of BW4 and PAM suggests that maybe altered NK cell function may play a role in the disease, so this should be an area of research in the future. So here's the epitope um, of the HLA BW4, and it is also associated with Bichette's um, psoriasis, so I think this is why we're seeing psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis in our kids, and maybe PAMS. And the reason why I say maybe is because we have to replicate the study before we can say for sure it is associated. But knowing this has actually helped us understand our cohort a little bit better um, because we now, instead of just asking at entry into the clinic about mouth, so, so Bichette's is an autoimmune disease that's highly linked to psychiatric disease. You also get recurrent mouth sores, um, recurrent genital sores, um, inflammation in the eye. Most children do not get diagnosed with Bichette's. They start having symptoms, but they don't meet criteria until adulthood. So what we do now in our clinic is um, at every visit, we ask about mouth sores, genital sores. We, we screen our kids for eye inflammation every year or two. Um, and we also ask about new rashes um, in the children and in the first degree relatives. So you only need one first degree relative to have psoriasis. Um, in order to um, diagnose things like psoriatic arthritis. So a child with joint pain and a, and a family member with psoriasis um, makes, is a very important clue to the clinical history. So like all inflammatory diseases, um, we see a high rate of blood dyscrasias, including leukopenia and lymphopenia, which is probably the most common blood dyscrasia we see in our patients. Um, we also see uh, non-specific um, positive autoantibodies, including ANA, histone, and the thyroid antibodies. So again, just pointing to the, the you know, more evidence that, that these kids have an autoimmune milieu. Um, and like lupus, these kids have immune complexes, as indicated by the elevated C1Q binding assay. So that's present in 34% of our patients that present to our clinic. 41% have a low C4, 
um, and 69% have an elevated C4A. You have to be careful if you do decide to order C4A that you handle the specimen correctly. Some of that, those might be false positive or trying to develop a new assay right now that is a little more reliable. Um, but the kids that have uh, complement activation and consumption may be a different subtype of PANS. Um, we don't know yet, but it is interesting that it is, it, it is a feature of lupus as well. And we did see that C4A in the highest quartile does correlate with um, a psychiatric global impairment score. So on physical exam, um, some other things we see at onset, um, we can see palatal petechiae. Palatal petechiae is a very important clinical finding because um, it's both supposedly 95% um, sensitive for group A strep. But the vast majority of our children that had this finding did not have strep at the time of the palatal petechiae. So we suspect that we either missed the infection or um, there's some other infection that's causing this little small vessel uh, damage in the roof of the mouth. We also see a lot of periungual redness, um, Terry's nail, which is that red band at the end of the nail. We see that more in chronic cases. And then also the levito reticularis, which is another uh, blood vessel disorder. It, again, it's not specific, but it seems to be um, in, our in our patients. Um, and additionally, kids with these findings tend to have high D-dimers and von Willebrand's factor antigen. So in addition to pain from arthritis, we also see a lot of pain amplification. So this is, um, this is not a made-up disorder. These kids are really suffering from pain. It's when um, pain, the, the pain processing center is basically amped up. So the, these children are feeling pain to a greater degree than whatever their physical um, problem is. So, they, so the most common things we see is headaches, abdominal pain, widespread pain, and complex regional pain syndrome. 15% of our cohort met the strict criteria for fibromyalgia. So this is very important to address this in the kids. This is one of the reasons why kids don't want to go to school um, or they drop out of sports is because they're truly in pain. Um, most of the time they don't mention it, but when you ask them or you do the fibromyalgia exam, they will you know, sort of jump off the table and feel like they're in pain. Um, they also, um, like uh, um, adults with pain syndromes, um, these kids are very fatigued, with 41% having problems with feeling unrefreshed, having unrefreshed sleep, um, daytime fatigue, cognitive symptoms, and exercise intolerance. Um, so we, so this is when we only looked at these percentages if they had the symptom for three months. We looked at this data again if they've had continuous symptoms for six months and the percentages are about the same. We also see a higher rate of immune deficiency in PANS um, compared to the general pediatric population, but it's still the minority of patients in our PANS cohort that have immune deficiency. And all of the children that, ha that met strict criteria for a primary immune deficiency had recurrent sinopulmonary infections. So we don't screen for this in every kid, but in a kid presenting with PANS with a history of recurrent infections, you should look for this. So these are the guidelines um, that we developed, and of course, we were very limited by there not being hardly any randomized trials. Um, but part of the um, guidelines were developed really to, to rein in some of the, the crazy treatments these poor kids were getting um, and to help clinicians that had never seen a PANS kid. Um, so our main goal is first to look for uh, an infection, and if there is an infection, to eradicate it. The only time we go after an infection that isn't there is um, with group A strep. We do screen all the household members. We do look at the sort of epidemiology of what's happening um, in the school, and then we decide whether or not the kid should be treated for strep. Um, then we, the next goal is to treat the post-infectious inflammation. Some of these kids just get better after eradicating the infection, but some um, do need a short course of NSAIDs or steroids if they're in that relapsing and remitting course, and I'll give you some data there. Um, but most importantly, to treat the psychiatric symptoms um, with the standard of care, CBT, um, SSRIs. Um, Dr. Tiedemann is just about to publish an article that these children do tolerate SSRIs but at a much lower dose um, than a typical um, child. 
Um, and if they don't tolerate it during the PAN's acute flare, in fact, we see that they don't typically tolerate it at the, the very um, beginning, but they can tolerate it later on. So this study was done in Sid and Ham's Korea, and so we decided to do it in our PAN's patients, basically looking at an oral burst of steroids um, on the time course of the initial flare of PAN's, and we saw that um, a burst of steroids reduced the number of weeks um, that the patient was in the first flare. And again, we always address the infection first before we give the steroids. We also looked at that group of kids that have relapsing and remitting pants, so not the kids that develop chronic patient, chronic static symptoms, but the ones that sort of have this relapsing and remitting course. And um, we saw that uh, flares treated with steroids were shorter than flares not treated with steroids. So we looked at 318 flares not treated and 85 flares treated. So of course this has to be looked at in a randomized trial, but this is maybe it's just some preliminary data we can look to. And we also looked at NSAIDs. So this first column are kids that are on NSAIDs um, that have PANS and arthritis and they stay on NSAIDs. So if the kids stay on NSAIDs, we had seven kids in that group. The average flare while on NSAIDs was eight weeks. Um, and then in the kids not treated at all with NSAIDs during the flare, um, the average flare was, I don't know, closer to 12 weeks. And then if there was early introduction of the NSAIDs at the beginning of the flare, um, then uh, that, the average flare length was closer to nine weeks. So we did some machine learning on, um, we actually worked with a, a lab at Stanford who grouped all of our patients according to what medications they got. And this was just um, sort of a way to see like what were our prescribing patterns were. Um, and interestingly, there's this one group, so the third column over, that really just got two things, um, a penicillin-based antibiotic and a little bit of NSAIDs in the beginning. And that group, interestingly, it's the third row, or third column again, had a gradual improvement in the global impairment, and that's the top row. The bottom row is, is caregiver burden, gradual improvement in caregiver burden. But as the penicillin um, usage dropped off, you can see the impairment scores and the caregiver burden scores go up. So again, not very much data, but, some, but definitely a subgroup of patients that um, can teach us a lot. So I wanted to end with some information on caregiver burden. Um, for the families, I don't have to tell you how hard this illness is, but for the clinicians in the room, um, if the families are coming in distraught, it's because they are really living in, in hell. I mean, this is a very, these children are very hard to care for. Um, we looked at caregiver burden inventory, so the Novak and Novak, which has been used to study caregiver burden in lots of diseases, including childhood diseases, um, and, and for caregivers with Alzheimer's. And in our PANS cohort, the caregiver burden was higher than, that's, than what's reported for Alzheimer's cohorts. And it's equivalent to the caregiver burden in Rett syndrome. So the doctors in the room, the pediatricians know what Rett syndrome is. It's a very severe neuropsychiatric disease that's recognized. And these families get a lot of support. Um, PANS families don't get support. They don't get respite care. A lot of their own family members don't believe it's real. So these families are really on their own um, dealing with this. Um, so we found that um, there's a certain threshold of the caregiver burden where you're supposed to give the family respite care and 50% of the patients that presented to our uh, clinic um, exceeded that caregiver burden threshold for respite care, but almost none of them qualified for respite care through insurance. So again, these families are on their own. Flares predict increasing caregiver burden. Um, each year established in our clinic predicted a decrease in caregiver burden. Um, and the shorter time between onset and coming uh, to our clinic predicted greater improvement of caregiver burden over time. So I wanted to end with acknowledgments for all the wonderful people that work in our Stanford PANS clinic. Um, they range from immunologists to psychiatrists, 
um, to nurse practitioners, and we're grateful everyone is very dedicated to this. And because of their hard work, I can focus on developing our biorepository. We're up to 200 patients. Um, we try to get draws throughout the time course, at least several in the first flare, and then in remissions and relapses. Um, and then I wanted to thank the Global Lyme Alliance because they are funding our healthy control project, which is really important for our scientists to compare our samples um, to healthy controls. And we have about 10 research labs we're collaborating with. Um, many have promising preliminary findings, and I hope by next year these findings can be confirmed so that I can share some of the basic science data with you all. Um, but we're very grateful that they're dedicated to studying this illness with us and also for the research funding that we've received through Stanford, the NIH, as well as um, community organizations and, and grateful donors. So thanks very much for your time. as well to write down questions that we are going to speak about tomorrow in the panel discussion because you will be you will participate in it as well. Uh, I was thinking about uh, I mean pans and pandas is uh, a somatic disease as well as uh, a psych or multiple psychiatric disorders. Mm -hmm. Who should make the diagnosis? <laughs> Is it, yeah, is it the rheumatologist, the pediatrician? Yeah, the no. rheumatologist, yeah, we're terrible at diagnosing psychiatric disease. <laughs> That's why we have three psychiatrists in our clinic. So yes. the actual PANS diagnosis, um, I mean, I prefer that a psychiatrist diagnose it. Of course, there's not enough child psychiatrists out there for all the kids that have this. So we're trying, I know Kiki has been going around giving a lot of talks to pediatric groups, but really the pediatrician is the front line and should be identifying this. Um, but for confirmation, it would be great if the psychiatrist could, could really help because there are other disorders that can look like this, you know, bipolar, I mean, although it doesn't have that OCD, um, you know, there's, it, so yeah, so I think psychiatrists should make the diagnosis, but they should team up with an immunologist or rheumatologist or somebody with interest in sort of uncovering the, the inflammation. Yeah, and another question is, uh, how does the length of an untreated PANS patient affect uh, the treatment response? Oh, that's a great question. So for all inflammatory diseases, yes. the longer you go untreated, the harder it is to control. Um, and the reason why is because the immune response evolves and gets stronger through time, especially if you have untreated disease and you're having relapses. With every relapse, we think there's um, sort of you're invoking more immune pathways or you're having things called the epitope spreading, so that the immune response is spreading. So the goal with all inflammatory diseases is treat it early and aggressively. I mean, of course, there's still a lot of controversy as to whether this is an inflammatory disease, but when we see kids, um, we try to get them in as quickly as possible and treat them quickly. But you don't want to start the immune modulation before you treat the infection. Yeah, okay. And uh, you were talking about uh, fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Sweden, I'm told, there are quite a few mothers with ME. Uh, the question is here if there could be a connection between ME and fibromyalgia in adults and pants children. Well, yeah, so we do see um, a lot of first degree family members with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, but we also see that these kids themselves develop the, the pain and the fatiguing illness. So we, we suspect it's a part of, of the spectrum. Okay. Yeah. And then based on the findings uh, from the Stanford PANS uh, cohort, uh, do you think all patients with the PAN and PANDAS will respond to the same approaches? 
No, I don't think there's going to be a magic sauce for all the nope. kids. <laughs> I suspect this is going to be like a lot of inflammatory diseases, like lupus, where you have heterogeneity within the group. Um, so, I, and you know, not only does time course um, influence your treatment, right? I mean, if you have a brand new onset kid compared to a kid that's had disease for years, those those kids are going to be treated differently, obviously. Um, but also within that, right? Like we have kids in our cohort that have the low complements, the high immune complexes, um, and that might be that that might need a different type of immune um, sort of uh, cocktail versus kids with more of the inflammatory back pain, psoriasis, you know, the capsule thickening on ultrasound. Those kids may respond to, you know, therapies used more in those types of rheumatologic diseases. So I think it will be important to subcategorize um, these PANS kids. The the psychiatric symptoms, you know, like and that's why I started off with lupus and, and inflammatory back pain is because all these inflammatory disorders, or many of them, have psychiatric symptoms, right? The psychiatric symptoms may be very downstream to what's happening. So I think we need to have to see what's happening upstream before we, you know, sort of design these clinical trials and then and also treat our patients. I read somewhere that uh, your professional goal is to understand the neurological factors that contribute to mental health disorders and finding effective treatments, of course. Uh, how close are you to your goals? Uh, <laughs> well, the, 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 the intermediary, intermediary goal was building the biorepository and finding the scientists. So we're there and we yes. have preliminary findings. Um, and so I, I don't know how close, how close are we. It's, I, it's hard to know. I mean, we could have um, a major finding and then the clinical trial fail. So I mean, people are still looking, trying to understand what lupus is, um, trying to understand what causes inflammatory back pain. And although we don't really understand those, we have made tremendous progress in treating those disorders. So I do think we will make a lot of progress in treating PANS pandas, even before we fully understand the disorder. So that I am optimistic about. You were talking about the parents' or relatives' burden, care burden, burden yeah. care. Yeah, I remember Bur exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I've understood that behavior therapy for parents or parents' coaching can help manage uh, the symptoms, but but isn't going to cure the underlying uh, problem. Right. So, what is there to be done? Right. So. I mean, this is where it's so important to look for the underlying causes in each individual, right? Do they have symptoms chorea? Do they have arthritis? Do they have dysregulation of their complement? I mean, I think that if you can understand what are the, um, some of the underlying factors, um, you're more likely to, you know, get the kid into a, a remission. And the behavior therapy is important for rehabilitation, but I'm not sure that's going to prevent relapses. Um, exactly. We'll talk more about treatments and diagnosis and uh, a lot more in this the rest of the day and tomorrow, of course. Thank you very much, Jennifer Frankel. She'll be back on stage.